The number 10 HBCU player of all time, Michael Strahan. I ain't gonna lie to you, I ain't got many options in life. This is what I was built for. I know I'm fine as a mother but I was built to play football. That's what my mentality is. Michael Strahan is a guy that built his career brick by brick. Here's a kid that spent most of his youth in Germany, and then he goes to Texas Southern, uh, which is not exactly a powerhouse. At Tiny Texas Southern, Strahan was a powerhouse and was drafted in the second round. The Giants have selected Michael Strahan, defensive end, Texas Southern. And he just willed his way through all of these different stages of life to end up being one of the greatest pass rushers of his generation. He was clearly one of the best, if not the best of his era. And I think by far the best two-way defensive end post Reggie White. When he gets on that football field, he's, he talks real greasy to you. All day long. Right, Your boy can't you touch me. Bring it out You can't touch me. And it's so funny because he's such a nice and gregarious guy. I have nothing to say. If I get out of my face, let me play. It's my first game back. It's making me nervous. But on that field, you, you are not trying to see that cat, man. He would tell you, I'm going to whip your ass coming up on this next series. Put your ass on the ground next time, Bubba. Guaranteed. Strahan is so good, he could make a sack through the gap in his own teeth. Super athletic guy, was a front four guy who didn't look too big, but just athletic and strong, and he was great. And it's intercepted by Michael Strahan! Touchdown! <laughs> For 15 seasons, Strahan called New York home. Before being elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2014. Woo, welcome, welcome home, baby. Daddy, daddy, woo! Yeah. Now let's talk about him having the most sacks in a single season. Play fake, rolls right, oh. gets sacked by Michael Strahan. We know Brett Favre laid down, but that's okay. Yeah, he deserves the record as long as you give Favre an assist on that. <laughs> Is it me or as he went down, he didn't tap him to get the tackle. He slipped a $20 bill in his helmet. That's weird. I was at that game. When the quarterback walks into you and then kneels down, it's not a real sack. It was a two-hand touch sack too. It wasn't even a real tackle. The number nine HBCU player of all time, Art Shell. When you think of Art Shell and you start ranking these players from historically black college universities, Art Shell at number nine, you can make a strong case that it's way too low. Number nine, yeah, you're probably putting him a little low there. Yeah, he's way too low because this is one of the great American football lives of all time. This guy does not get enough credit. He started for 14 straight years for the Oakland Raiders. Let that sink in. I would almost want to put Art Shell a little bit higher because not only was he a great offensive lineman, obviously a Hall of Famer, but he became a pretty exceptional coach, too. He is a Hall of Fame player. He's one of the greatest offensive linemen ever. I'm a little surprised he's not in the top five. Because he was a great player and broke all types of barriers in the coaching and executive realm. Art Shell ranks among the greatest offensive linemen no matter what list you put up. Art Shell was a guy who was amazing from the word go. A guy from Maryland State, now Maryland Eastern Shore, to play on a small college level like that and accomplish so much with such brutality and physicality, paving the path for those Raiders teams, he's one of the all-time greats. A member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Art Shell was an eight-time Pro Bowl selection, a two-time Super Bowl champion, and was voted to the NFL's All-Decade team of the 1970s. You know, when you put the silver and black uniform on, you get such a surge of energy. Art Shell blocking in front of you essentially takes away half the pass rush or more because how are you going to get to the quarterback when Art Shell's in front? 
pound for pound, maybe the strongest left tackle in NFL history. John Madden called Art Shell the smartest player I ever coached. The combination of technician and mauler that he was really special. Top five offensive lineman of all time. I don't care what list you're talking about, I don't care what era, Art Shell has to be mentioned as one of the all-time greats. Not only was he a dominant player of one of the NFL's iconic teams at one of the heights of their power, but he transitioned that into being a head coach for nearly a decade as well. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about this. It's coming home. It's coming home to finish what I started. Art played such a significant role. The great Hall of Fame player, obviously. First African-American coach in the modern era. These are contributions that transcend just on-field contributions. I just need a little bit more from you from what I saw, guy. Because of what he did, not just as a player. One thing you got to understand is the only way to play this game is you got to get down in the dirt and get nasty. Let's go. But a pioneer as the first black head football coach in the NFL in modern days. All we got to do now, man, is just go out there and knock the hell out of him, okay? I put him right at the top of my list. I think as a coach and a player and somebody like that, I think that he might deserve a little bit more consideration. Number eight, HBCU player of all time, Jackie Slater. Number eight. When you hear Jackie Slater and you think of him, you think of excellence. If you tell me that someone played 20 years in the NFL, I'm impressed. When you tell me they were 20 years as an offensive lineman, I almost lose words. Jackie Slater excelled for 20 seasons. What more did he have to do to get higher on this list? Most football fans and historians and people of some level of intelligence would know what Jackie Slater meant to the NFL. Jackie Slater may be the best pure right tackle in NFL history. When Eric Dickerson came into the league in 1983, he set the NFL single season rushing record for a rookie. The following year, he set the NFL single season rushing record. He's got it at a brand new single season rushing record. And a big reason why was because of the offensive line of the Los Angeles Rams, and Jackie Slater was a huge part of it. Dickerson pops out of the middle of the 40, to the 30, to the 20, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown! It was like deja vu for me because I played with Walter Payton in college, and I remember when the scouts would come down to Jackson State, they figured the guy was having some success because of someone. After blocking for Walter Payton at Jackson State, Slater was drafted in the third round in 1976 and helped the Rams' running game flourish for two decades. Blocked for so many good running games. I mean, he blocked for Charles White. When Charles White had all of those yards in 1987, a guy named Elvis Peacock managed 4.7 yards per carry behind Jackie Slater's line. Who is Elvis Peacock? When you talk about longevity in professional sports, that's a huge thing. He's playing against Terry Bradshaw in the Super Bowl, then blocks for Eric Dickerson, then ends up blocking for Jerome Bettis. Jerome Bettis, the rookie out of Notre Dame, like lightning into the end zone. Think about that. And to continue to do your job for two decades at one position, and at that position, puts him in a whole different category. I mean, Jackie Slater's longevity is ridiculous. And he was so good, he played for the Rams in the LA Coliseum, Anaheim Stadium, and Bush Stadium. This is a guy that came up in the 70s and left in the 90s. The number seven HBCU player of all time, Doug Williams. You can't write the history of the NFL without Doug Williams. Doug is another guy that, you know, just changed the course of history. Prior to Doug Williams coming to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, there was a stigma that black quarterbacks weren't smart, black quarterbacks could not take instructions, black quarterbacks could not be leaders. Doug Williams destroyed all that immediately. He comes in at a time where still black quarterbacks were not widely accepted and the Buccaneers were just a couple of years removed from being an expansion team, and an 0-14 expansion team. And he takes over a quarterback and immediately gives credibility to the offense. Just getting them from a spot of being 0-14 in 76 to the NFC Championship game in 1979, I think is a pretty remarkable accomplishment. When he turned that franchise from a laughingstock into a winning organization, it was with an African-American 
playing in the most important leadership role on a team. That sent a message not only to the NFL, but to colleges, to youth football, to kids that needed someone to look up to. Yeah, it's a big, big deal. After leading the Bucks to the NFC Championship game, the former first round pick from Grambling finished his career with the Redskins, where he played one of the most memorable games in NFL history. My memories of his performance in Super Bowl 22 is that, you know, there were probably three camps there. You know, one camp that was saying, I hope he wins. One was saying, I don't think he can win. And then there was a third group saying, I hope he doesn't win. And I'm not talking about because they were football fans. I'm talking about race. From hearing the ignorant questions to, you know, when do you know you were an African-American quarterback? Seriously, like, when did you know? You know, the most important thing about this, you know, uh, Joe Gibbs, Bobby Babbitt, Jack King Cook didn't bring Doug Williams to San Diego to, to show off a black quarterback. Uh, we know why we came here. We came here to work hard and win the Super Bowl. In a sense, it really kind of captured what the world was like for Doug Williams because people viewed him as a black quarterback more so than just a quarterback. The world was looking at this man and put a heavy weight on his shoulders, and he knew it. And to be able to go in there and carry that weight says a lot about the man's character. <laughs> that second quarter is one that will just go down as magic. You talk about getting into a zone, I mean, that was it. In the second quarter, Williams threw for 228 yards and four touchdowns. When he won a Super Bowl, it's like, yo, we can still, we can do this. And for the first time, it felt like here is an African-American that we can look up to who is at the pinnacle of his sport and no one can do anything about it. I would go so far to say that Doug Williams' performance is either 1A or 1B or 1C given the entire circumstances. Most valuable player of Super Bowl 22 is quarterback Doug Williams of the Washington Redskins. The first black quarterback to start a Super Bowl, the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl. I'll tell you what I hope Doug Williams does. I hope he puts to bed once and for all about the black athlete in professional football. Until Tom Brady came around, I mean, that was the, the performance you always looked at as the seminal Super Bowl performance. Watching Doug Williams, I mean, he opened the doors for many. To see him doing it, going against and defying the odds of getting it done. Dude, come on, man. I mean, that was special. And every time I see him, it's always Mr. Williams, all the time. The number six HBCU player of all time, Willie Brown. I just always love any excuse to talk about Willie Brown. Willie Brown was such a great corner. And he played cornerback for 16 years in the NFL, which is an amazing feat in itself. At a Grambling State, one of the iconic HBCUs, so already there's a, a heritage and a prestige that comes with him. Is it difficult to be snubbed by both leagues, the AFL and the NFL, and become a star? It happens, and that's when you have true greatness. I don't care how you slice it, how many excuses we make, undrafted by both leagues, yet you're in the Hall of Fame. That's worthy of not just a TV movie, that's a full-length feature. Undrafted out of Grambling, Willie Brown was a nine-time Pro Bowler, a five-time first-team All-Pro, and is a member of both the AFL All-Time Team and the NFL's All-Decade Team of the 1970s. I think that Willie was one of these guys who was just such a fantastic athlete. And Al Davis really wanted to play this bump and run style of defense. He was doing bump and run you know, before we were talking about bump and run. Well, you had to be pretty strong and physical to be able to do that. And Willie could. Willie Brown was by the book, textbook defensive back play. He was a bigger man who could use his hands and control and reroute receivers. And then run with him. Old man Willie was just this guy that would be at the line of scrimmage, knock his wide receiver off their stride, and then stay with him. You, know, you just didn't throw the ball near Willie. Consistency. Every single Sunday, he was going to be a lockdown defender. He gambled, but he gambled intelligently. I mean, he would take chances, but he rarely got burned on them. I mean, the play where he picks off Fran Tarkenton in the Super Bowl was a play where it was just really an anticipation play. To me, the moment that I think of is Super Bowl XI and the, the pick six touchdown, a then Super Bowl record 75 yarder that he streaks back for a score that I think we've seen replayed a hundred times. Well, thanks to NFL films, the iconic play we all have of Willie Brown is Old Man Willie. He's going all the way! Old Man Willie! Old Man Willie! The 
that's just like one of the greatest NFL films, sound bites, moments, pieces of footage ever. The camera is just looking right at his face, you know, every little contortion and every emotion that he's running through. Look at the Oakland Raiders joining him. They're coming off the bench. They're mobbing him down in the end zone. That was one of the great things that the Sables did with NFL Films is they, they really made football personal. If you're gonna take one signature play for Willie's career, that's probably it. And it sort of combines everything there, is, is the great anticipation, the daring, and then the ability to pull it off. And now, the number five HBCU player of all time, Willie Lanier. Willie Lanier was as heavy a hitter as you'll find. Well, his nickname was Contact, <laughs> so that kind of gives you an idea. Good shape, baby! <laughs> he was a contact player. Willie Lanier put the fear of God in you. I mean, he was as big as some defensive lineman. And when he would come up and fill the hole, believe me, he filled the hole. His hits were so impactful, so violent, that he was one of the few players of that era that got extra padding from the team, but not inside his helmet, outside of his helmet to help the opponent receiving the blows that he would give them. He was absolutely dominant. Quarterback of the defense and a team leader that was extremely well respected. Whatever the assignment called for as a middle linebacker, he could do it. He was 245 at a time when most middle linebackers were 225, 230, and he could still play sideline to sideline. He was so long and so tall, and so his leverage was so unbelievable. If you put together a highlight reel of some of the biggest hits of that time, Willie would be in on a lot of them. A second round draft pick out of Morgan State, Willie Lanier was an eight-time All-Pro and was named to the NFL's 75th anniversary all-time team. I think of his style of play as being this, just this crouched position kind of where he would explode. And when he would explode, he would explode hard. When he got to a ball carrier, it wasn't just a tackle, it was an explosion. At the time, I don't know that the world was realizing what a milestone event that was when Willie Lanier became an African-American starting at middle linebacker. That's the quarterback of defense. There was a perception at the time that certain positions required more intelligence and maybe black players weren't up to it. Willie Lanier proved that theory wrong, one of the smartest and most important defensive players in his era. To have a black player play middle linebacker and play not just on as a starter on a team, but on a world championship team, a Super Bowl championship team, is as historic, I think, in the game as a quarterback, like Doug Williams winning the Super Bowl. What a moment for all of the Kansas City Chiefs. They're beating the best that the NFL has to offer out here today. They had five of the 11 starters are in the Hall of Fame, and yet there was never any question, as much greatness as there was on that defense, there was never any question about who the leader was. I mean, that's the definition of greatness. The number four HBCU player of all time, Mel Blunt. Oh, of his era, for, I'm right at the top. How can you argue anybody was better? I mean, he was just that dominant. He was unbelievable. You have no idea, like watching him play, it was like grace. It was like, it was a thing of beauty. All he did was make plays. And he winds up and throws, intercepted by Blunt at the 20. Mel Blunt came up with the interception. We're just about simply erasing people. You know, we talk about it all the time now. Can you find that lockdown corner that takes away half the field? Mel Blunt was a forerunner of that. He just doesn't look like the guys we look like now because of his size. Whenever it mattered, Mel Blunt came through. He made every play ever that came his way. He never missed. He was a can't-miss, surefire Hall of Famer. I love Mel Blunt. Mel Blunt, <laughs> this is one big guy out there. And when you're lining up as a receiver and you're facing Mel Blunt, you know, you better bring your lunch pail. He was the biggest corner I ever saw that could light you up like a middle linebacker. I mean, he literally hit like Jack Lambert. And then you see Mel Blunt walk around and you're like, oh, what NBA team did he play for? Oh, he played cornerback? 
for the Steelers. Drafted in the third round from Southern University, Mel Blunt played 14 seasons for the Pittsburgh Steelers. A key component of the famed Steel Curtain defense, Blunt was named the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year in 1975. He looks like what a modern day linebacker, maybe even for some in defensive end looks like. He is a massive, strong man. And to think that he was out at corner and guys were trying to get off the line of scrimmage, he would hit guys at the line of scrimmage coming off the line and just take him out of a play. He was so big, he was so physical, you just couldn't really get any air against him. And so the league goes, that guy's really good. We have to kind of do something about it. It's kind of like not allowing Wilt Chamberlain to dunk. We can't allow you to do what you've been doing for your entire career. It's too effective. And it got to the point where they literally had to make the rule change, you know, the five yard separation. He was just that devastating and that big and dominant of a player. When you get a rule because you're too dominant, that's when you're an icon. That's when you are an all-timer. That's when you are a Hall of Famer. You might as well call it the Mel Blount rule because he did it. You talk about a rule being made and named after you, that kind of tells you how good you are, right? Mel Blount was the game changer, Hall of Famer, playmaker, touchdown maker, hitter. I'd let Mel Blount sleep with my wife. The number three HBCU player of all time, Deacon Jones. It starts with the eyes. When you can just intimidate people with your eyes, then you've got something going there. I love Deacon Jones because I'm scared of Deacon Jones. When you think about Deacon Jones, you think of a guy that is the epitome of being an intimidator. Deacon Jones was also in that violent gentleman's club. And Deacon literally put the fear of God into whoever he played against. I love Deacon Jones because Deacon Jones haunts my nightmares. Those dudes like that, man, they can't make those anymore. I didn't invent it. I didn't invent the hit slap. Um, I perfected it, OK? Rembrandt didn't invent painting, either. <laughs> the signature definition for Deacon Jones was the head slap. Anytime time you go upside a man's head, they have a tendency to blink the eyes or close the eyes, and that was all I needed. Drafted in the 14th round out of Mississippi Valley State, Deacon Jones dominated for 14 seasons, and many believe he is the greatest defensive end of all time. Deacon Jones was as dominant a defensive lineman as the game's ever going to see. The Deacon is Reggie White before Reggie White. To me, Deacon Jones was probably the greatest defensive end to ever play the game. What I loved about Deacon Jones, it was like, I'm gonna walk up to you and just slap you and just show you, you can't do nothing about it. And by the way, I'm gonna make the play. That's why I love watching old NFL films. And you were like, good God, man, this dude just, he's gonna hit anybody. When you look back at film and watching these guys, could they play in the modern NFL? Deacon Jones would excel today. He would actually be one of the best players of all time, even if he played right now. And Dave Jones is in to drop him for a 17-yard loss. Deacon Jones, I'm going to slap you, and you can't do nothing about it. Before Deacon Jones came along, when a defensive lineman would dump the quarterback for a loss, that's pretty much what they called it. Then Deacon Jones came along and they coined a term, the sack. Sacking the cornerback is just like, uh, like, you, like you devastate a city or you, cream, or you cream a multitude of people. I mean, it's just like, like you put all the off offensive players in one bag and I just take a baseball bat and beat on the bag. Just think if we could count Deacon Jones's actual sack totals in the all-time NFL sack totals, I have a feeling they put everyone else's to shame. The sack didn't become an official stat until 1982, but Deacon has been unofficially credited with 173 and a half of them, which would rank third on the all-time list. When you think about that term and the magic behind that word, it's so fitting for Deacon Jones because he was such a charismatic figure. And you combine phenomenal talent with good perspective, and hard work and commitment, you come up with Deacon Jones. I don't think that there should be a number two. I don't think there should be a number three. I think there should be a 1A, a 1B, and a 1C. And I would never tell Deacon Jones he doesn't belong in the top three. In fact, you tell Deacon Jones he didn't make number one and number two, because I'm out on that.
Deacon Jones was, was one for the ages. The number two HBCU player of all time, Walter Payton. His name is Sweetness. That's what they call him. He's just sweet. I mean, I think Sweetness is the perfect name for him, Sweetness. And I have to go with Sweetness, Mr. Walter Payton. I would have no problem the NFL retired 34 across the league. Even now, you hear people talk about Walter Payton. There's even a Walter Payton Award. He encapsulated everything that you want a football player to be. Sweetness was sweetness. I mean, the guy is just total legend. Sweet, huh? Sweet. <laughs> Walter Payton was never supposed to be that good. Jackson State. It was a bit of a reach to go to an all-black school and get this kid named Peyton with the fourth pick overall in the draft. But the thing about Walter is that there was nothing on a football field that he couldn't do. For 13 seasons, Walter Peyton ran around, through, and over opponents. A member of both the 1970s and 80s NFL All-Decade teams, Number 34 retired as the league's all-time leading rusher. High formation, quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record, cuts back, he's got it, he's out of the 25 to the 26-yard line, Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher surpassing Jim Brown, and that's the equivalent to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. Walter Payton is the best of all time. He is the GOAT. He was just so smooth when he was coming out of those cuts. Walter Payton was the best athlete to ever play the position. This is a player that combined skill, agility, and grace with the ability to run straight down your throat. You see him accelerate through people. Think about every time he put his head down, slammed into a linebacker. Think about every time he could have walked out of bounds and instead took on a tackler. Walter decided he wasn't going to be stopped. He wasn't stopped. Man, when you watch the NFL Films footage of him running up the side of that hill, and you know he's doing that every day of the offseason, that just tells you everything about what made him great. He brought an attitude to the game and a desire to succeed that wasn't common in the league, period. Walter Payton was the toughest running back ever. He fought for every inch. I mean, he ran violently. Walter Payton delivered a blow like no running back I'd ever seen at the time. He had a stiff arm. The stiff arm had kind of left the game in the 50s and the 60s. He brought that back. You got two choices when you're a running back. You can run around somebody, you can run through them. I feel like Walter embraced and enjoyed running through people. Walter liked to deliver blows more than receive them. Walter Payton. He played with absolutely nobody, so you know every defensive coordinator knew that all you had to do was stop Walter Payton, and you couldn't do it. Let me tell you something about Walter Payton. You would get the defense like, see that guy? Yeah, tackle Payton. And Walter Payton would be like, they're giving me the ball. They're giving me the ball, and then he would run 30 yards past everyone. Walter Payton's personal motto, never die easy. That just defines every run of his entire career. And a lot of guys that went against Walter made business decisions. And those business decisions was like, this ain't worth it. Let me attempt to tackle him, but let me just move out his way slightly enough where it doesn't hurt me as bad. And I hope that the cavalry is coming, we can jump on. Never die easy was essentially every hit and every run and every play of his NFL career. If he's number two, please tell me who number one is. If Walter Payton is number two, I know who number one is. And now, the number one HBCU player of all time, Jerry Rice. I know who number one on the list is out of Mississippi Valley. His name is Jerry Rice. Any list that has Jerry Rice on it, you have to put Jerry Rice first. Jerry Rice should be number one on this list because of his talent, because of the numbers he put up. When you think about Jerry Rice, a lot of people think he was the greatest player in NFL history. When you look at Jerry Rice's career, how can you, you know, dispute that this guy is number one? Greatest player of all time. Jerry Rice isn't just the greatest football player from historically black colleges. Jerry Rice is the greatest football player, period. And then to think that he came from Mississippi Valley State really makes you appreciate his rise to prominence even more. Mississippi Valley State? I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, who comes from Mississippi Valley State to play in the National Football League? The word on Jerry Rice when he came out of Mississippi Valley State, incredibly exciting, electric player, 
did things that you had to actually look up. Like, that really happened? He caught that many passes? Like most kids, the greatest wide receiver ever to play the game grew up playing catch with his father. But Rice's pop wasn't passing pigskins. And then you hear his story about how he developed his hands because he caught bricks from his father on construction jobs. Yo, Jerry's the best. He caught bricks. Jerry Rice came up catching bricks, said his daddy would just toss bricks down off the roof for him to catch. It's easy to catch a football after you can caught a brick. And if you're catching bricks for a living, you better have good hands, because if you catch it wrong, it's going to hurt. Jerry Rice is so good, I'm trying to figure out why more daddies don't make their kids catch bricks, too. Man, listen, the hardest working man in the history of the NFL. One of the things that really stands out about him is his work ethic, taking every rep in practice, catching the ball, and taking it to the end zone every time. It's little things like that is what separates him. He was going to do it the right way every single time. Make the catch, go 30, 40, 50 yards downfield, get into the end zone, come back, do it again. And he would be out there before practice, he'd be out there after practice. Jerry Rice was the guy that practiced when there wasn't practice. If there was a day off, he would still practice. It was just a treat to watch Jerry Rice work and practice every day. Nobody got more out of themselves over the course of their life than Jerry Rice because he worked tirelessly. He trained harder than everybody. He worked harder than everybody. He caught more touchdowns than anybody. Everything that he gets, he deserves because he works so hard for it. I am more than fine with Jerry Rice being number one. So he's got to be number one because he's the greatest wide receiver ever. He's arguably the greatest football player ever. Nobody argues who the greatest wide receiver is. To me, he's not just number one on this list. He's number one on all lists for all football players ever. I feel like when you put all the other Hall of Famers around him, I feel like they all look up to him and realize that he was the best. Watches it for the end zone! Jerry Rice! He must be the greatest receiver! He's a bad man. This show could really be the best players of all time. We don't have to be the best players from historically black colleges. I mean, the best wide receiver, the best running back, the best defensive end. I think we have it all right here in this show.